Um, hello, uh, I'm David Scott, and I'm uh, going to talk to you about TPS 3.0 and its use of Petsy. Um, <clears throat> Petsy is a, uh, sorry, TPLS is a program which has been under development for a while. And here we've got a list of the major contributors to it. There have been others, but uh, I've got a limited amount of space on the slide. Um, it uh, has been funded by EPSRC through the ECSC program, that's the latest version. Uh, before that, uh, there's been a mixture of ECSC and uh, DCSC funding. And it makes use of PETSI, as I said, which is the portable extensible toolkit for scientific computation. And the picture there is of an uh, evaporating droplet, which has been produced by a version of the uh, code that we have, not the publicly released one, but it's, we hope that we'll soon be able to incorporate that capability into it. So the history of public releases is shown here. Um, first public release was in 2013. Uh, the public versions have developed out of various uh, other code developed for research purposes over the years. Um, it was, so they were hand coded. we generally with Jacobi saw solvers um, and what we did in uh, the first public release was to introduce the first Petsy solver, which was for the pressure solver, uh, which is the most uh, time consuming part of the computation. Um, the program had a 2D domain decomposition, although it's free, for solving 3D problems, the decomposition was 2D and it used serial IO. Then we moved on to uh, introducing parallel I.O. and we introduced configuration files because prior to 2.0, uh, if things like the domain size were uh, in the code, you had to recompile to change them, which is obviously unsatisfactory. Still had to do the domain decomposition. And now in the current public version, uh, there is a 3D domain decomposition and we have PETSI solvers available for the momentum calculations in addition to the pressure solver. And uh, uh, a new, some new physics was introduced because now the fluids components can have uh, different densities. <clears throat> so you can find the code on SourceForge. It's available under BSD style license, and I'd encourage you to download it and play with it. Um, There are two types of calculation that you can do with TPLS 3.0. Um, there is uh, the Rayleigh Taylor instability, which is a, um, where you have two layers of liquid with the upper layer being the denser. And then you have stably stratified parallel two phase flows. What that means is that you have two layers of fluid with the upper being the less dense of the two and the flu fluids are flowing in the same direction. These can be quite complicated simulations. There are many lab scales and time scales involved, uh, and you have sharp changes in interfacial topologies. Um, so you've got transient effects, and, uh, which you have to look at over long periods of time in detail. So we require a scalable code that can run at very high resolutions in a reasonable amount of time. So these are the basic equations that we have. Um, it's two-phase incompressible Navier-Stokes equations with interface capturing. So phi is a, a scalar field which is used to locate the interface. Um, <clears throat> um, and here at the bottom you'll see FST is that's the surface tension uh, term. And the delta epsilon is a, a smoothing function, 
uh, smooths around the interface to phi equals zero value and uh, W is a value number. <clears throat> and of course, the normal to the interface. Uh, so a few technicalities then, We're using marker and cell discretization, pressure densities, viscosities and phi are at the cell centers and the velocities are located at the cell faces. In finite volumes with flux conservative differencing for the momentum equation. Uh, the momentum step uses center differences for the convection, convective derivative, triangulates of treatment for diffusion, and third order atoms of Bashworth for the time evolution. And then uh, the momentum are updated first, followed by a correction step involving the pressure update in order to force incompressibility. And the level set function is carried along with the flow, marked with corrections at each time step, which is known as redistancing. Uh, I would say I am a software engineer, not an expert in computational fluid dynamics. So uh, my last I'm going to say, I'm, I'm much happier to answer questions about uh, the code itself than on the physics or the behind it. Anyway, carrying on. So, as if there are two types of things we can simulate. One's the rail Taylor instability, and the other. So we'll deal with that first. So you have heavy fluid sitting on top of a light fluid with gravity acting downwards, and you introduce a perturbation. Here we have a sinusoidal perturbation to get things moving. And then the heavy fluid accelerates downwards, forming complicated structures. Uh, and the system is parameterized by the outward number. And if you look at that, it's a uh, dimensionless number, which is uh, tells you about the uh, ratio of the densities. And this example here, the heavy fluid is three times denser than the light fluid. And you can see the sort of things that you get. This is a typical Rayleigh Taylor instability. You can see the uh, dense fluid penetrating the less dense fluid and complicated structures developing as it does so. It's a useful test case because uh, you can make theoretical predictions about the behavior. Then we have stratified flows. Uh, the, the major difference here is that it's the, the uh, less dense fluid which is on the top. Um, which allows you to have stable flows. Um, <clears throat> Typh flow rates, you get an unstable equilibrium setting and interfacial waves develop. And you can get very complicated structures, uh, breaking waves, ligaments, droplets, all sorts of things. Um, the density ratio is an important parameter in these physical effects. So here's an example. The exact things that you see depend a lot on the parameters that you choose. But you can see that uh, we're able to simulate very complicated uh, interfaces. So, uh, now I've told you about uh, the sort of things you can do with PETSI, and now I'm going to talk about how you actually use it, uh, but not PETSI TBLS. In order to run the code, you need to do some um, configuration before runtime, which uh, two parts of that, describing the initial configuration and generating the initial configuration. That is the initial condition for your problem. And then uh, at runtime, there are two parts to it. One is specifying uh, the non petsy options that control how the program runs, and the other is specifying the petsy runtime configuration. <clears throat> and we'll go through these in order. So the initial configuration, uh, you, need, say you need to be able to generate uh, an initial condition and so to do that you need to specify various things 
you need to specify the size of the domain that you're using. You need to specify the integer space detection method. Uh, currently, the only one you can select is the level set method, as shown here. But uh, we have code waiting to be integrated, which will allow you to use the diffuse interface method, which is what you need to do, uh, use in order to simulate the evaporation of droplets and things like that. Uh, then you need to specify whether uh, you're looking at uh, a Rayleigh Taylor instability or channel flow. Here you can see I've specified channel flow. And then you go on and specify, say, the Reynolds number, the viscosities and densities. The height of the interface between the two here, I've specified it to be 0.5, which means it's halfway up, you know, Z being the uh, up and down direction. <clears throat> the pressure gradient that you have across the channel, and gravity, uh, a parameter to do with surface tension, and uh, finally the times, well, the time step, the smoothing, smooth width scale, this is the delta epsilon uh, parameter I was talking about earlier. And then, um, well, I can now then we talk about configuring uh, TPLS. You need to tell the uh, system how you are going to map the physical domain onto the process grid that you have. So you tell it what the number of processes, pro MPI processes you want in each direction. We haven't thrown away the um, original JSOL solvers. They're still present and you can choose to use them if you wish to, rather than the Krilov solvers provided by Petsy. Whether you do that or not is controlled at runtime by these flags. If you put uh, here, I'm choosing to use Krilov solvers all of the time. Uh, there's also quite a lot of monitoring code there, which you can turn on or off. Again, it's a runtime option. If you uh, you need some configuration parameters for the original JSON solvers, uh, whether or not you're using them, uh, and these are to do with the number of iterations that there are are used in each of the solvers. <clears throat> and then there are things to control the output frequency of various uh, uh, various uh, quantities that have been calculated, the number of time steps you're going to run the program for, a uh, parameter for the um, diffuse interface method solver, which is unused as yet, but it's there already. And then there's the runtime configuration. Let's see. Um, at runtime with Petsy, you can choose which Krilov solver to use. That's not hard coded, it's a runtime option. And you can control things like the relative tolerance that you're demanding for the convergence criterion and whether you want the true residual printed at the end, this sort of thing. And that's what you're seeing here. If you have a .petcrc file in the directory where your executable is, it will be picked up and it will read the options from that file. Now, um, if you look here, you'll see that, okay, I've got a KSP RTOL appearing a number of times, uh, uh, but they are different instances are uh, prefixed by different things. You might've got U underscore, B underscore, W underscore, P underscore. And that's because what I've done is I've associated a string with each of the solvers that I'm using. And by using that string, uh, prepending that string to the standard Petsy option names, I can tell it which of the solvers I'm configuring. So you can configure them individually. You don't have to use the same um, relative tolerance for deciding on the criteria, criteria for convergence. And you can see that in the pressure solver, I've gone a bit further. Um, and I've said I'm not going to use the 
default GM res solver. I'm going to use min res, and I'm not going to use the default preconditioner. I'm going to use a saw preconditioner uh, with the name of the value of 1.5. So there's a lot you can do at runtime. <clears throat> Petsy provides support for structured grids. It also provides support for non-structured grids through finite elements, but I'm not going to talk about that. We have a structured grid, and what you do, an important thing in doing this is you use a thing called a DM to describe uh, the structure of your problem to Petsy. And here you see I'm creating one, a three-dimensional one, that uses the Petsycom world. Uh, well, that's the um, for MPI, that's your communicator. And I've said I'm having to have uh, periodic boundary conditions in the X and Y directions, no boundary and specific boundary condition in the Z direction. That's because I'm going to insert my own. I have plates top and bottom essentially in the channel flow. And I'm going to use a stencil box, which means that uh, for each uh, grid point, I'm going to allow myself to use all of the surrounding points in a box of a size that are not yet specified. Um, you can say they just want to use them, uh, the values on the principal axes. That would be a star stencil rather than a box one. I'll specify the uh, size of the domain I'm using. I've added two onto the global dim set because I'm including room for my own boundary conditions, uh, the number of processes I'm going to use, MPI processes in each direction, the number of degrees of freedom that I have at each point, the stencil width. So you, here I've got a box. I can have a box where you uh, include things one step in each direction, or you could make it two, which you might need to do in some cases, and so on. Uh, and then you uh, Pepsi X lengths is an array which tells it how many <clears throat> uh, grid points I want to associate with each process in the X direction. If you specify Pepsi null integer, as I've done for the Y direction, it'll just, uh, Pepsi will decide for you how it's going to split the domain up amongst the processes. Um, again, I've specified how I'm going to do it in the Z direction. And then the DA underscore S is the object that's created. Well, once you've got a DM, you can do various things. You can create global or local vectors. Global vectors are used for holding uh, the uh, global data. They, they only hold um, only those bits associated with the local process are available on that process from global uh, vector. If you try stepping off that patch, then you'll get an error. But you do need to be able to uh, do calculations involving the ghost or halo points. And the way to do that is you create a local vector and then you populate it with values taken from neighboring processes using this DM global to local begin. And once you've done that, it'll uh, you'll have the uh, ghost values that you need for your computations. What get what values are transferred depend on the stencil that you specified earlier. <clears throat> and then you can uh, uh, associate, uh, you can create a matrix associated with that DM, which you can then use uh, in your computations. You can populate it. Here you see in the third line, I've got compute matrix P. That's populating the uh, uh, matrices I've created uh, to describe the problem. I'm then associating that with a, uh, a KSP, that's a solver object. So it's telling it that it's going to use this uh, matrix uh, in the solver. I can then call KSP solve and it will just do things for me using the options I specified earlier about which Krilov solver I want to use and so on. And uh, I'm just tidying up at the end you know, to release the memory that's been allocated. So it reduces uh, 
the amount of work you have to do considerably once you're comfortable with the way it works. It does take a little bit of time to uh, get used to it, but once you've done that, it saves you an awful lot of coding and allows you to experiment quickly with different preconditions, different tolerances, and different solvers. <clears throat> uh, so how we did, what's it done for us? Um, the 3D decomposition that we introduced gave us a, a huge increase in performance. Um, so on 64 nodes, we got a factor of two speed up and um, it um, saved us the uh, trouble of doing all of the hand coding in the 3D decomposition, which is, I've done it in the past and it's quite a lot of work. Um, the Krilov solvers haven't shown us an increase in performance, um, but it's actually quite difficult to compare because they have different termination conditions. The original solvers just ran for a fixed number of iterations, whereas the Krilov solvers are uh, the convergence criteria are based on things like relative or absolute tolerances. Um, it may be that in going, the problems we've looked at so far have been relatively small. It may be that the PETC will give us a greater advantage when we go to larger problems because PETC uh, only works efficiently if it's got a reasonable amount of data to work on in each process. <clears throat> Adding the density contrast doubles the execution time. That's not too surprising. You're doing quite a lot of computation. Uh, there's an ECS re re ECSE report on this where you can find out more if you wish to. And um, we do have further work planned this is just dependent on getting uh, funding for the software effort involved. We have existing code on countercurrent flows and a droplet formation, which we would like to incorporate. We have code which includes heat transfer, mass transfer, uh, which again we'd like to uh, include. And we would like to go beyond the simple geometries that we're looking at at the moment although that's uh, significantly more work. We don't have the code uh, just lying around ready to be incorporated. And well, that's all I want to say for today. Um, uh, willing to answer some questions if people have questions. Well, um, I don't have anything further to say. I'll sit here for a minute or two more just to see if uh, you, um, anybody else has further questions. But otherwise, uh, we're done. <laughs>